And that's where you say that this is like unto that. This set of circumstances resembles that set of circumstances. For example, playing a game to a tie is like kissing your sister. I've never kissed your sister, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> now, some analogies are ennobling. For example, during the Civil War Battle of Chancellorsville, it was remarked, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Others are meant to be taken entirely poetically. My love is like a red, red rose. Does not mean she's skinny, three feet tall, green, covered with thorns, and had weird things coming out of her head. <laughs> <laughs> Some are meant to be emphatic. You get in my face again, I'll have you on the ground like a calf in a rodeo. <laughs> Now, lawyers, of course, and I am an attorney, lawyers are, or are supposed to be, masters of analogy because analogy is the basis of the American legal system, coming actually from the British, the English, common law system. This set of facts or circumstances, which we don't really know, is similar to this set of circumstances that we do know. And therefore, the rule that governed this set of circumstances can be transferred to the present circumstances, and we win. Hold on, says the other side. This set of facts only looks like that set of facts, but they can be distinguished, and therefore, Your Honor, we win. And that's what the whole legal system, in a nutshell, and you can take that literally if you wish, <laughs> you honor the facts of this case are like the facts of the famous case of first, Snapple versus Shagnasty, 666 Northwest 2nd, 101, 1947, in which the court found that even though the plaintiff, Mr. Fern Snaffle, was in the house as a burglar, that did not give the defendant, Mr. Shagnasty, the right to whack him upside the head with a frying pan. In the same way, Your Honor, my clients snuck into the movie theater without a ticket, but that did not give the, t the theater manager the right to whack him in the face with a bag of popcorn. <laughs> we want a million dollars of free pass in the movies and a fresh bag of popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> this is life unto that. Analogy. The building block of the law, each case presents a unique set of facts, and yet the ruling in each case can provide guidance for generations of lawyers, judges, law professors, law students to weave an ever more complex tapestry of the legal, fa legal fabric. Now, you've all heard the expression, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Of course you have, and basically it's true. But did you know how it came to be? It all started with a fox in upstate New York in the year 1805. It seems that one Mr. Post was chasing the fox when one Mr. Pearson spotted the, the critter, killed it, and kept it. Post sued Pearson, claiming that because he was pursuing the fox, it rightly belonged to him. An application of the timeless child's lament I saw it first, so it's mine, mine, mine. And you know what? The New York court agreed and awarded damages to Post. Not so fast, <laughs> cries the New York Supreme Court. Let's take another look. Post may have been chasing the fox, but it was Pearson who reduced it to possession. Aha! That, says the court, is what confers ownership. Reduce it to possession, and it's yours. Ever since then, ever since then, law students have studied Pearson versus Post for the basic legal principle that having beats wanting every single time. <laughs> and the seeing it first doesn't matter if the other guy catches what you're chasing. 
Because the rule of analogy governs American law, it doesn't matter what you're chasing, whether what you're chasing is a fox, a contract, or your best buddy's girlfriend. <laughs> Possession is nine-tenths of the law, and the other tenths generate, generally doesn't matter. Nowhere is this more so than in the area of the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution. That's the one that's supposed to protect us from unreasonable searches and seizures of our person or property. The one that says that the government needs a warrant to search you or your property, and a warrantless search is, by definition, unreasonable. Believe that? Ah, I've got oceanfront property in Nebraska to sell you, folks. It isn't all bad. Warrantless searches of houses are still considered a no-no, unless, of course, the police think there are drugs inside, and if they announce their presence, you'll flush them down the toilet. As long as there's reason to believe there's drugs, bash the door down, put everyone face down on the floor, let the dogs get within a snout's reach of the terrified occupants and go to work taking the place apart. Wrong house, bad info, too bad, so sad, sorry about that, and have a nice day. Support your local drug enforcement team. <laughs> Enter the automobile, and that's where the fun begins. The United States Supreme Court, under the late Chief Justice William Rehnquist of Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, who was, by the way, a drug addict, addicted to prescription drugs, 1975 to about 1982, took about three times the prescribed dosage. Anyway, the Rehnquist Court went through the Fourth Amendment like Katrina went through New Orleans. Here's how they did it. First, the police don't need a warrant if the stuff is in plain view. You've got a gun or a package of cocaine sitting on the front seat. They see it, you're gone. <clears throat> Fair enough. Then, they don't need a warrant if a drug-sniffing dog indicates that there's drugs inside the car. Dog, dog search isn't even a search. Drugs, a dog sniff isn't even a search. And finally, the icing on the cake. The, ice, the highest court in the land now says that as long as the cops could have gotten a warrant, they can go ahead and search <coughs> without one. It's like the legend of the great serpent that swallows its own tail and has no beginning or end. It's sort of like that Aflac commercial with Yogi Berra. If you could show that you could have gotten it, you don't got to get it. Get it? <laughs> <laughs>